Today we are in Aswan, southern Egypt. In front of you, unfinished obelisk. This place is extremely important to understand the ancient monuments of Egypt. During our trip, you're gonna see some of those monuments, pyramids, temples, obelisks. The one that we won't see is, uh, well, we're gonna see it from the far. It's called the Black Pyramid. On the top of the Black Pyramid, there was a pyramidion, the shape of the pyramid, made from this obelisk right here. Then the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid of Egypt, and also the second pyramid, the Kefren Pyramid, the chamber over there, they were made from material from here, from granite. Of course, obelisk in Luxor. If we go to Google and we put distance from Aswan to Giza, it's going to give us a result of 867 kilometers, which is 500 miles. We start thinking about the construction process, we have logistics involved. How to transport very heavy material southern Egypt to Giza, 500 miles. It's a logistic nightmare. Plus, we are not even on mile here. So whoever was moving the stuff from here, if they used River Nile, which is the beginning, rather logical explanation, they will need to drag it from here to river. Of course, there is an idea when, you know, River Nile has the highest level, it comes much closer, put it on the river Nile, on the wooden barges, they uh, go all the way to Giza, they uh, embark and they move to the desert to build chambers in the pyramids. That's an idea, we will see how it really happened in the past. Now, this is very important rocky hill, it is made out of granite. Granite is one of the most precious materials. Why? Because it is extremely geologically old, meaning it is very hard. When it is very hard, it lasts forever. So, for the construction workers, it's very important to have granite as a material. However, it is very hard to work with granite. On this particular place, this place is called Northern quarry, northern quarry. We have three types of granite. We have black, gray, and red. What is this here? We have reddish color. Black, gray, and red. When it comes to their hardness, they are over 200 megapascals. Compared with the concrete that we make today, they are in the range from 10 to 60 megapascals. This is 200, meaning duration, lifetime 
is much, 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 much longer. One of the features of the granite is a lot of quartz. Now, quartz is extremely important, especially for the pyramids, because the quartz transforms the energy. For example, if you hit the quartz with electromagnetism through the piezoelectrical effect, it generates mechanical waves, ultrasound. We'll discuss it in details. The second important energy feature is the radiation. This material, you know, releases the radiation. And it becomes important for the pyramid builders. The block behind us. Let me teach you how to calculate the mass. Now, it's very important in every science, including archaeology, to use the right terminology. The terminology that we use on this planet is weight. How heavy? Wrong. On different planets, the weight is different. The mass is like the absolute terminology. How do we calculate the mass on this planet? The length of this unfinished block is 42, about 42 meters. The width, what you would say, about 4 meters. The depth, the depth close to 4 meters. How thick? Close to 4 meters. So, we multiply the width, the length, and depth. So, 42 meters times 4, 168 times 4, it's about 600. So, 600. so, it's a little bit less, really. It's 3.5, here's 3.5. So, one, uh, 42 times 3.5, it's about 130 square meters, times 4, it's about... 500 cubic meters, 500 cubic meters. And then you multiply that with a specific weight. For granted, it's about 2.2. So if, it, if you have 550 cubic meters times 2.2, it is about 1,200 tons. In order to get precise number, I would need to get down there and take measure. And then I could tell you exact mass of the unfinished obelisk. But I would say yes. The numbers that they mention in encyclopedias about 1200 tons is about right. It's about 1000 metric tons. Until the end of the 20th century, the biggest capacity lift, the crane, that we had in our civilization was 350 tons. Mm. So, until 15 years ago, we could lift only 350 tons. And these were not movable cranes. These were fixed crane that would stand at one place. When they tried actually to move that one, they went to the highway in the US, they crashed the highway. So the crane was so heavy. The capacity 350 tons. Here, we have 1,200 tons, almost four times bigger mass. If our civilization, 15 years ago, did not have technology to move this, how did ancient builders move pieces of such size? When you go back to Egyptian time, what we do know like 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. They did not have technology to move such a big mass objects. We couldn't move it in the 20th century. Now, in this particular case, you need to lift it. When you lift it, it's technology. When you move it, of course, you can put some wooden logs below, round, push it, and try to move it somehow. But then again, if they place it on the barge, the wooden boats, driving it along the river Nile for 870 kilometers, and then again 
unload it at the Giza and then moving to the pyramid destination, it is for sure logistic nightmare. I can guarantee you. Ancient Egyptians, as we know them, during the pharaonic time, the last, uh, the last period, last 5,300 years, they did not have such knowledge. So obviously it was more advanced civilization. 30 years ago, the Japanese tried to make the replica of the whole journey. To cut it, they were extracting it using like wooden wedges, making a hole to the wood, dry wood, then getting water every day, and then with the water, the wood expands, and if you have enough wooden pieces, then the stone cracks. Theoretically, it is possible. But how to get it up and move it, we don't know. Because Japanese made the replica that wooden barge, not with 1,200 tons, with two ton blocks, two tons, 2,000 kilos. You put it on the barge, the barge sunk <laughs> on the bottom of the yes, river Nile. Of course, of course. <laughs> it's logical. Three years ago, they tried to repeat this experiment again. And it was on uh, Discovery Channel. They cut piece of two tons, put it there, barge or sun. So what they did, they trimmed that piece to one ton. <coughs> one ton it could hold. But when you explain construction, you need to explain the biggest pieces first. Yeah. The biggest piece in the Great Pyramid of Egypt, which they call Cheops or Hufu, is 80 tons. You need to explain 80 tons. The biggest piece in the second largest pyramid, Kefra, is 220 times. There is no reasonable explanation how would people from that time move such a mass, such a transport. The next important thing, uh, making those obelisks. You heard the story from Muhammad. Most probably the reason why top representing sun and we have sun rays. Maybe. However, we're going to learn during this trip that geometry was extremely important. As a matter of fact, some geometrical shapes and some mathematical numbers are so important that they became elements of sacred geometry. Mm. You have sacred geometry, you have movement of the energy. Very soon, you will realize the pyramid building process actually about the energy, how to amplify existing energy natural sources. The bubble is pyramid on the top, there is a very specific reason why such geometrical shape is on the top. Now from this place a lot of material went up 900 kilometers. Why? Because there was no other place such a good quality granite around the Giza. There is a small place in Sinai, there is another one a couple of hundred kilometers from here, but quality is not so good. Now, during this trip we're going to also learn about other materials, about limestone, which has been used heavily, especially for the pyramid constructions, about the sandstone, we're going to use about the mud bricks, mud bricks very common construction material, not only in Egypt, China also, the pyramid building. As a matter of fact, this is construction material even today. And the interesting thing is, the older it gets, the more superior material was used. The younger, the inferior material, mud bricks. How is that possible? They teach us in schools. Everything about the human is the evolution. 10,000 plus years ago, we were on the primitive caveman level. Today we are the most intelligent. Well, exactly in the case of Egypt, we can see the opposite. The first pyramids, the first monuments, were 
are based on the most superior material, which involves everything design, cutting, extracting, transporting, erecting. So, we need to rethink because what they teach us in schools is wrong. The history of humanity is not evolution, it's a cycle after cycle after cycle. When you add to that, that there were not one, but many episodes of visitors on this planet, you will realize that our history is much richer than we previously thought. Mm. And this place is one of the very important, <coughs> because here we can see visually what they were faced with. They had to cut such a huge, long, If you go back for more than 3,000 years, the major tools in Egypt were copper tools, yeah. hardened copper tools, bronze. We have something that it is called the Mox scale. This is a scale of hardness. For thousands of years, people tried to make a scale Hello? and Hello? to compare to compare the hardness of different materials stones and wood, organic material and so on. So the mock scale is one of the try to make the classification. Mock scale, we have scale from 1 to 10. For example, number 1, the smoothest and the softest material is talc. talc. Gold, silver, they are 2.5. Copper, is number three. Iron is number six. Granite is about 6.5. Diamond is number nine. However, it doesn't mean that from uh, steel six to, to diamond number nine, it's a small difference. As a matter of fact, the absolute scale, if talc is number one, then diamond is 1,400. So it is 1,400 times harder than top. Now, if you have copper tools, which is 3 or 3.5, and you have granite, which is 6.5, how do you shape, how do you cut superior material with inferior tools? There is no way. The idea hardened copper still it does not answer the question. However, what we have here, I did mention the wood looks rather the primitive, but it can be useful to some extent. There is another material which is found right here, it's called dolerite. Dolerite is very hard material, a little bit harder than a granite. But then how do you make a tool for materials? which you cannot shape. And then to do everything manually doesn't make much sense because it would require not days, not months, but years and years just to make perfectly flat one surface. When you come to Luxor, for example, you see those obelisks, it's perfectly flat. Some of those surfaces are laser straight so straight that they can be used as the instrument. So even though Egyptologists and archaeologists have been trying to find some answers, I wouldn't say they can satisfy all of us. Because in science we really need good scientific argumentation. And then, very important question. We know that Egyptians, they were communicating. They were the hieroglyphic symbols. They were the papyrus. About, you know, a lot of paintings. To build a pyramid, it's a project that, according to Egyptologists, took 19 or 23 years. One pyramid. It was such a huge undertaking that you would expect that designs and scenes from the construction process, starting from Aswan all the way to Giza, is everywhere. It's nowhere. How is it possible? 
you will need to have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people involved. <coughs> it's basically, you don't have nothing from the era of building the three major pyramids, Cheops, Kefra and Mykerinus. Or Bent Pyramid, or Red Pyramid, or Black Pyramid, or Joseph Pyramid. It's a very important question. Working in the industry, I realized, if you are to make little box, you have to have at least three, four drawings. But if you are building a pyramid, which is so challenging, you will need to have stack of big drawings. How to do that? We haven't found anything. Of course, when we come to Giza Plateau, we will be discussing different theories, how it was built, but important documents are missing. How it was done, we need to stay open-minded. So open-minded that if we say more advanced civilization, we might have another form of communication without the limits that we have with the writing. If you write a little paragraph, and I give it to six of you, everyone will have a little bit different understanding based on our educational background, culture, experience, skills, and so on. So, our way of communication is rather limited. It's not perfect. The most perfect way of communication is when you are able to exchange the thoughts, which is called telepathy. Is it possible that we have a group of people, of beings, communicating in such a perfect way, figuring out the design, and execution, I don't know, it's possible. I'm just inviting you to stay open on different options. While you were gone from um, Unfinished Obelisk, I had the privilege to walk on it and do measurements. And this is what I measured. The length of the obelisk from the tip, from the very tip, down to the base is 47 meters. 47. The width at the base is four and a half meters. And then the obelisk is getting more narrow. And just before the tip is 3.5 meters. When it comes to the depth, to the height, it's the same like the width, because it is basically square obelisk, but getting narrow. So when I did the calculation, width times height times length, it is 700 cubic meters. And the specific weight of uh, granite is 2.2. So 700 cubic meters times 2.2, it is 1,540 tons. Official number is 1,200. So, it seems that they, they got it wrong on Wikipedia other places. They were projecting for 1,200, but it seems that it is more than 1,500. This is very important information because today, and this is 2018, the biggest crane on the planet is one in China, which is fixed. Its capacity is 1,000 tons. So there is not a single piece of equipment on the planet right now in the 21st century that could move that block if it was finished. Yeah. Now, obviously, whoever started cutting it, cutting it, they did not start cutting it without thinking how they're gonna move it hundreds of kilometers to the north. You don't start such a huge project without the idea how to transport it. So, they did have a good idea how to transport it. It seems to me that uh, the cutting process was rather rudimentary. Probably they were using some people explaining them how to cut it. But the transportation was done in a very sophisticated way. I doubt that uh, it was done through the River Nile, even though it would be a rather logical explanation to move the weight, to move the transport. Yes, but if it is loose, smaller pieces, such a huge piece would require very advanced technology. Today, we would need, I don't know how many helicopters to move that, but then the problem is if you have more than two helicopters, you know, 
there is a real danger that they're going to crash. So it remains uh, an open question, which brings us to the area of uh, using uh, technology different altogether. Maybe t technology of sound, technology of the frequency, technology of ultrasound. And we do have recorded activities on Tibet, for example, how they were moving blocks with the sound. In the 1950s and 1960s, there were two film crew, one from Austria and one from Sweden, who were recording Tibetan monks during the temple building. So early in the morning, the monks gather around the block, which was rather small compared to this one. It was two-ton block, but still too big to move manually. So a group of monks made a half circle and some of them were with the classical Tibetan instruments. And then they started producing music and uh, singing. singing. It was more like a mantra. Very slow and very quiet in the beginning, becoming stronger and stronger. At one point, the block moved and it started going up. Now, above, in the upper part of the cliff, there are two monks waiting for this block. This block was moving like it did not have gravitational force anymore. And it seems that with a very specific tone, with a very specific frequency, they are able to neutralize gravitational force. So this block is going up, two monks are waiting for it. With just a couple of fingers, they move it, set it in the place. This temple does not have access road so it was literally built using the ultrasound or sound frequencies very specific frequencies does it mean that they apply the same technology here we don't know is it possible that thousands as a matter of fact millions of blocks move from one part of egypt to another it is possibility that's why i told you let's just stay, let's just stay open-minded for different options.